There are those that, that'll fight for due process, and there are some of us who challenge the system every way, every day, from small case to large. What does it mean to put yourself on the line for your beliefs? Today on The Laura Flanders Show, I speak with actress Kathleen Chalfont, who's known for her brave performances and her principled political stances. And we look at Stanley Cohen, a lawyer who's gone to jail. His supporters say he's being punished for the clients he's represented. All that and a few words from me on theater, you and me, and Israel-Palestine. It's all coming up. Welcome to our show. Carol Churchill wrote Seven Jewish Children, A Play for Gaza, in response to Israel's 22-day siege of the Gaza Strip in 2008. The piece is still relevant today. Watch as Kathleen Chalfont and others read from the play in an exclusive performance from our show in 2009. Tell her they want to drive us into the sea. Tell her we kill far more of them. Don't tell her that. Tell her that. Tell her we're stronger. Tell her we're entitled. Tell her they don't understand anything except violence. Tell her we want peace. Tell her we're going swimming. Tell her she can't watch the news. Tell her she can watch cartoons. Tell her she can stay up late and watch Friends. Tell her they're attacking with rockets. Don't frighten her. Tell her only a few of us have been killed. Tell her the army has come to our defense. Don't tell her her cousin refused to serve in the army. Don't tell her how many of them have been killed. Tell her the Hamas fighters have been killed. Tell her they're terrorists. Tell her they're filth. Don't. Don't tell her about the family of dead girls. Tell her you can't believe what you see on television. Tell her we killed the babies by mistake. Don't tell her anything about the army. Tell her. Tell her about the army. Tell her to be proud of the army. Tell her about the family of dead girls. Tell her their names, why not? Tell her the whole world knows, why shouldn't she know? Tell her there's dead babies. Did she see babies? Tell her she's got nothing to be ashamed of. Tell her they did it to themselves. Tell her they want their children killed to make people sorry for them. Tell her I'm not sorry for them. Tell her not to be sorry for them. Tell her we're the ones to be sorry for. Tell her they can't talk suffering to us. Tell her we're the iron fist now. Tell her it's the fog of war. Tell her we won't stop killing them till we're safe. Tell her I laughed when I saw the dead policemen. Tell her there are animals living in rubble now. Tell her I wouldn't care if we wiped them out. The world would hate us is the only thing. Tell her I don't care if the world hates us. Tell her we're better haters. Tell her we're chosen people. Tell her I look at one of their children covered in blood and what do I feel? Tell her all I feel is happy it's not her. Don't tell her that. Tell her we love her. Don't frighten her. A lot of people talk about art and politics meeting. Our next guest, actress of stage and screen and TV, says in the case of theater, it's not about meeting. Theater itself is a political act, a collective one. And she should know. Not only has she starred in award-winning roles in plays including Wit and Angels in America, she also studied classical Greek at Stanford. Kathleen Chalfont is currently enjoying an enormously successful run in the award-winning Showtime series The Affair sometimes cast as a charming voice of reason on stage. Off it, she's also an outspoken advocate for justice in the Middle East and right here at home, fighting incarceration. I couldn't be happier to welcome back to the show my friend Kathleen Chalfont. Kathleen, welcome to the program. Thank you, Laura. I'm very glad to be here. So you're just having a ball doing the affair, right? I am having a ball. There are no bad parts of the affair. It is um, astounding makeup. All the wisdom talk about the important yes, things. Yes, no, the first, important right? things. Start right so, there. Astounding makeup, clothes that I couldn't imagine existed in the world, let alone would be hung on my shoulders. 
and the, it's uh, amazing writing, and all of the actors are the kind of people that you could talk to all day long, both on stage and off. And your role is kind of interesting. It's not a typical Kathleen Chalfont role. Whoa. She, I love her. She, she says all those terrible things that no one else would ever <laughs> dare to say. And, of course, she did write the books. That's right. So. <laughs> you have to watch the series, people. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, is it available free on, on cable anywhere yet? I have no idea. No, it's I, don't, I only found out last week that I was coming back on the second season. So How could they possibly do it without you? Absolutely no way. TV. Now, you've got, as I said, hum humongous experience in theater, in stage. Um, let's talk about the stage for a minute. Uh, you received a Tony nomination, of course, for Angels in America. You also received numerous awards for that incredible off-Broadway play, uh, Wit. People still talk about that extraordinary performance with your bald head and naked body. <laughs> um, is it as hard as it ever was to get good roles like that for women? You know, I have to say, I've been extraordinarily lucky. I didn't. I basically didn't work at all until I was nearly forty. So I, I missed all those roles. Um, but I've been really lucky, and in the last few years, m more uh, wonderful parts have come. Uh, Alex Dinolaris's play. Um, um, Red Dog Howls. Mm -hmm. I've played uh, Agnes in A Delicate Balance three times in the last six years. And I saw um, you most recently in Claire Coss's wonderful play, Dr. Du Bois and Mrs. Ovington. Uh, Miss Ovington. Miss Ovington. Miss Ovington. I didn't know of. One of the co-founders of the NAACP, a white woman. There's a great line in that play. Um, where Miss Ovington says, white people need a revolution. I think she says, to ignite our humanity. Yes. We do, right? We do. Well, it's, you know, it's always harder for the, uh, for, uh, you don't want to say Privile it. Privileged people have the luxury of uh, working for peace and justice, and then when it gets too hard, you can go home to your nice oh. house. And that's true of, of all of us who have had the, the, I don't know, good fortune or bad fortune to live a life of privilege. For the majority of people in the world, it's not a choice. Right. You can't just opt out at night. Um, and so uh, the kind of empathy that it's necessary to feel to live a life of sacrifice like Miss Ovington did because she gave up for in great part she gave up her privilege means giving up lots of things that we like to you know sort of yeah. hold back now you could just do your incredible work and go home at night but you don't you, you've been active as long as I've known you and, and long before I'm sure you always say you're not active enough, so I will spare you from saying that because it's just not true. Um, what do you learn from theater that you bring to your political work? You just talked about empathy. That's obviously part of it. Well, as you were saying before, I believe, I always think, I, it always worries me when they uh, uh, take the arts out of education and particularly when they take the theater yeah. out of education. Talk about that. Because all the skills you need to make a play are all the skills you need to build a society that works. What do you mean? In, a, in, a, in the production of a play, every single person, from the person who's the star of it to the person who tears the tickets in the lobby is essential mm. to making the thing go. The majority of people who work for it work toward what looks like uh, someone else's uh, uh, s certainly moment in the spotlight. Mm. So it's about cooperation. It's working for the common good. All these people are trying to get the play on. There's lots and lots of deferred gratification. Um, and it's not commodifiable. You don't make a commodity of it in the way. I mean, no. you could sell. A, you could charge a lot for the tickets, but 
It's an experience. It's not something you take home in a it pretty It only purse. exists. Every single performance only exists in the minds of the people who have performed it and the people who have watched it at that moment. And the thing that's made is this thing in the middle. Mm. And I've, I work sometimes with a, a wonderful theater company called the Epic Theater Ensemble who teach in the schools and have an after-school program called Shakespeare Remix. And they take the, the great plays and the students, it, and it's after school, so it's entirely a volunteer program for these kids. It goes on from three to five, mm. and it takes all your time. And it's um, Shakespeare, and everybody understands exactly what's going on. Everybody does all of those things that I just yeah. said they need to do. And in the end, they make this extraordinary thing. I hate to bring us down from this high of theater, because I, I love theater. But it has to be said, in the US, movies occupy a much bigger place in most people's consciousness. And as you described on this show many years ago, movies are quite different when it comes to the question of the collective versus the one. Much more they of focus are. on the one. I think movie well Although movies they take more people. Movies and the and the television. I would I would argue now that with streaming and all like that, long form television is the most important and in some ways the best mm. popular form of entertainment. And I think maybe I'd think different the the exper the experience for the actor is different because you're, by the time the thing comes out, you're, it's been months ago and you're sort of alienated from the work. Yeah. But I would also say that to make one of those things successfully, I would now say also requires right. a collective. Um, well, I like that. I think you can't, I, I think you can't do it well otherwise. Mm. When you were here last time, uh, we talked about what had recently happened, which was the 22-day Israeli assault on, on Gaza. You and I went to Lebanon together. Now it's tw nearly 20 years ago. God, I know. Uh, and I guess my question for you has to do with that part of the world. You're on the board of the Freedom Theater of Janine yeah. um, in the West Bank. What do you see happening? What do you see in terms of signs of progress, good, bad, ugly? I don't know. Mm. I've been saying lately, oh, it's going to make me cry, I used to know where to go to sign up. Yeah. And I don't know what we are to do. I've come to believe that that the Abrahamic religions are all the same religion, and they all, those things that are good about them, faith, hope, and charity, are all good in almost the same way in all three of them, and they all go bad in the same way. They all uh, uh, move toward uh, control to some uh, notion of the chosen people, and almost immediately to patriarchy. Yeah. And all that, all that follows from patriarchy. Um, there are, uh, you know, there are the most obvious versions of it are the ones that we all know. But we are the uh, the same way of thinking is in some way uh, all through the Western world. Yeah. You know, the the rise of of fascism and nativism in Europe is terrifying. The rise of n nativism in America, which seems nonsense. Mm -hmm. What does that mean, <laughs> nativism in America? Nobody's from here. Right. I, I, though I did, Some I people. once said that to Jeffrey Wright, <laughs> and he said he was from here yeah, because, on both sides. Oh, yeah. But both. Um, but you have to, it's a long time, yeah. about 10,000 years ago, to actually say you are from here. The theater, the Freedom Theater of Janine, has to be said, is, is continuing after the assassination and the of freedom, its leader. The Freedom Theater, I think that 
that we, in, in a way, the, the Enlightenment was an attempt to deal with the downside of, of the, the Abrahamic religions. Um, it has its, God knows, many, many, many downsides, too. Um, in this case, what you, can, what you hope for from what's left of the, the Enlightenment is, are, it, it, it is the fact that in secular societies, uh, there, it, it does, at least it isn't enshrined any longer in the yeah. Constitution, uh, the, the patriarchy. And one of the great contributions, and perhaps one of the things that uh, made Giuliano so dangerous, is that this most charismatic, um, incredibly sexy, most masculine of men was a great feminist. Yeah. So before we let you go, there might be people watching who don't get any longer drama in their schools, who don't feel like they have any access to this real, weird world of, of, of acting, um, but maybe listening to you want to get a little closer. How do they do it? How, how do they bring theater into your life? Well, I think, the, f the, I think the, the question of arts in the schools are essential. Art is not, uh, I say this all the time, but it is true, art is not an amenity for the privileged. It is the deepest expression of the human soul. And if you take it out of education, then we will fall into, uh, what, I don't know, the horror. Abyss. The abyss more quickly. So when people talk about, uh, ta about art as being inessential, yeah. I think we have to rise up and say that's not true. How many refrigerators are there that don't have their children's pictures mm. stuck on them? Mm. That's not an accident. That's what people do. Barbarism is the word I was looking for. We will fall into barbarism if we allow, if we allow art to be sucked away from us, if we are told that it's inessential. So fight for it in the schools. Fight for it in the schools. Um, um, encourage your ch the thing. The wonderful thing about the theater is that it happens in every home that has a small child in it because that's what children do. Mm. They make up. Encourage your children to make up stories, to be characters. Play with them the best you can. Take them to places where people are doing things live because there's nothing nothing like it. You could grow up and be Kathleen Chalfon. <laughs> you can do much better than that. <laughs> Kathleen, thank you so much. And uh, I can't wait to see the next season of The Affair. Me too. functioning democracy and a functioning judiciary requires uh, attorneys who are willing to step up and take uh, clients who, uh, for whatever reason, have been demonized by the wider society and by the state. And if essentially you snuff those attorneys out, if you disbar them, if you disenfranchise them, in the case of Stanley, potentially even send them to prison, uh, what you're really doing is eroding uh, the very process of uh, an objective uh, judicial system and, and democracy itself. Criminal defense is all political. There's not a person prosecuted in this country that's not political, whether it's based on class, whether it's based on gender, whether it's based on, on, on race. There's a very fundamental common strain among my political clients. There are people who say no, they resist. They need advocates. It's what I do. I stand with them, I 
fight with them, I support them, and it's what I do. I view my work as friction on the machine. I view my work as trying to fuck with it because it's, it's corrupt. There's systematic problems because the judges, because the prosecutors, because the police are essentially corrupt and indifferent or malignant in the whole situation. And I view myself as throwing myself into the machine. There are those that, that'll fight for due process and there are some of us who challenge the system every way, every day, from small case to large. This has nothing to do with the IRS or tax evasion, uh, just as we saw with the disbarring and persecution of the civil rights attorney Lynn Stewart. This is about shutting out those very few radical civil rights attorneys who are willing to stand up and take on clients uh, who the state has demonized and who the mass public has, uh, in essence, convicted of guilt before trial. This case is about quieting resistance. This case is about sending a message. This case is about if you're gonna silence me, if you're gonna send a message to lawyers that advocate, that struggle, that push every day of the week, and if you're gonna allow them to get away with it, how much weaker we all are. It's not by accident that I've been targeted. It accomplishes a lot in their mind, but I've got a surprise for them. It's not going to silence me, it's not going to change me, and it's not going to silence and change a generation of people out there that are willing to sacrifice to change this fucking world. This is not just about protecting due process and our judiciary, but protecting what's left of our democracy itself. A play called My Name is Rachel Corey is returning to New York for the first time in nine years, 12 years after its young protagonist was crushed to death beneath an Israeli military bulldozer. Derived from her speeches and correspondence, the play tells the tale of 23-year-old Rachel Corey, who died attempting to stop the demolition of a Palestinian home in Gaza in 2003. Soon after her killing, Corey's family sued the Israeli Defense Ministry in a case finally dismissed by the Israeli Supreme Court this year. 90 minutes on the New York stage is no substitute for accountability in a court of law, but it's not nothing either. And in at least one sense, My Name is Rachel is a fitting requiem for Corey. As actress, activist Kathleen Chalfont put it right here, Theater itself is a political act. Every single performance, she says, is the product of the people who've performed it and the people who've watched it. And the thing that is made is the thing in the middle. Corey's texts, by her own admission, are sometimes scattered, but the play still packs a punch because it summons actor and audience to think about the Middle East together, to collaborate, as Chalfont would say, in the production of an outcome. And that's just how we're not taught to think about goings-on in Gaza. There, we're taught it's a complex affair for other people, far-off men. The reality is decades of war and occupation are a thing made in the middle, a mess made by politicians, British and American, as well as Israeli and Palestinian, voters who favor extremists, and corporations like Caterpillar who made the bulldozer, and U.S. taxpayers who foot the bill. It's a mess made by players who perform on the world stage, in other words, and also the world audience that watch. And that's just why Corey went to Gaza, as the play, which I saw in 2006, recounts, from the state of Washington, she traveled halfway around the world to see Gaza up close and to connect with Palestinians who rarely make the news in any role other than victims or victimizers. Especially at this time, as U.S. media mesmerize us with tales of steamy ruptures in the ongoing U.S.-Israel romance, My Name is Rachel reminds us that war and occupation are outcomes in which we too play a part. As in the theater, we collaborate, as Chalfont would say, in the production of an outcome. Thanks. You can write to me and tell me what you think. Laura, L-A-U-R-A, at GritTV.org.
This week on The Laura Flanders Show, Jesse Agopian, a reformer who helped lead a student revolt. We're seeing the school to prison pipeline being built with these high stakes tests. And New Orleans, a city that's transformed to an all charter school system. The more schools fail, the more money certain organizations can get to open new schools. They give no thought to what closing a school does to a child. What was happening in Berlin for me that was very special is like Imad was saying, there was a lot of creativity a lot of new ideas and there were a big openness to, to receive uh, new techniques. Uh, you know, people were going out with cages, with the artistic instruments, with really special ideas. And what we see in the film also is uh, the decision that I th find really brilliant to put the outpost uh, by, the, by the Palestinians themselves. They put their own outpost on their own land that was taken by the separation fence as if to show, to, to show, to expose the technique, the way the settlers are using the outpost in order to take their own land. So they were uh, really provoking to create debate in the media, in Israeli media and international media. My, my son Jibril, he just was born in 2005 in, in, in the beginning, in the first, two, uh, first week of the beginning of the struggle in my village. And it was uh, for him to just to, to open his eyes or to, uh, to, to make his steps to the wall or to, to, to say his words about army or uh, wall. It's, it was uh, difficult for kids to, to grow up like this under this uh, situation.